Hi, Rosamullins. Dear Wilfried, um, thank you very much for taking your time and being with us today. Um, so this is a cardiovascular lecture uh, on the focus of diuretic uh, therapy on heart failure. And I'm uh, so happy to not only um, welcome you today, but also Nina Görlich, um, who is a um, nephrology resident. So uh, Nina and me will be the ones trying to um, moderate the questions from the audience and trying to understand your lecture. Thank you very much. Um, you're uh, the lead of the heart failure unit um, in Genk in Belgium at your um, hospital, and you're one of the um, leading figures in the heart failure scene in Europe regarding um, the cardiorenal axis and both uh, CRT therapy. That's how I got to know you through the um, postgraduate course of heart failure, and uh, I'm super happy that you um, you, know, you accepted our um, invitation to talk to us today. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation, Jarit and uh, Nina. So I'll, I'll start straight away. I'm gonna share my screen with you guys. I hope you can see it. I guess you can, Jarit. Yeah, I can. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. So again, it's an honor to give this lecture to you. Uh, I would rather prefer to be in person in Berlin to broadcast it from there, but since COVID doesn't allow that, we have to use the, the, the technology that we have at hand. So diuretic therapy of heart failure, a very interesting yet very complex therapy that we use basically on every day in most of our heart failure patients. So, uh, I am a heart failure specialist and I like to have a physiological approach to towards everything that I'm doing. And I'll try to explain how I think you can improve the use of diuretics in heart failure and why you should understand the pivotal role of the kidney. And this is the way that a lot of people look at heart failure. I was fortunate enough to visit Iceland a couple of years ago. And when you're looking at this thing, it's actually in guys here and the geyser explodes almost every minute. And this is actually what happens to heart failure patients. Why? Because we do underappreciate the risk that a lot of our patients have to die or to be hospitalized with episodes of heart failure. The risk in DAPHF was 21% at 18 months. So that means that one out of five of your patients that you see on an ambulatory basis are actually dead or hospitalized after a year and a half. Once you hospitalize them, the risk for that patient to die or to be re-hospitalized goes up to 60% at 12 months, especially if you send your patients home with ongoing congestion. That means that reduction in congestion is a key target when you see a patient with advanced heart failure who is admitted to your ward. Why? Because congestion hampers end organ function and because lowering of congestion actually saves lives. It saves lives more than improving cardiac output. So reduction in congestion through the utilization of diuretic agents and vasodilators is more important than improvement in cardiac output. This is the way we're gonna build the talk. So first we're gonna talk about the pathophysiology of congestion. And when you do that, you have to understand the role of the kidney. The kidney gets about one liter of blood every minute. It gets 600 cc's of renal plasma flow. So that means that knowing a little bit of hemodynamics of the kidney is important. The kidney is extremely sensitive to increases of central venous pressure. If you increase central venous pressure, automatically the kidney function is impaired and that will lead to more sodium retention. So an increased central venous pressure contributes more to worsening of renal function in your patients than a low cardiac output. We did a nice animal experiment a couple of years ago where we did this a selective partial ligation of the vena cava inferior. And what you could see already after a couple of weeks that there were irreversible glomerular changes, meaning that even increasing central venous pressure for a couple of weeks in an animal, but probably also in human beings, actually leads to ir irreversible damage to the kidney. That is one of the many reasons why we're paying more attention also from imaging perspective to visualization of the kidney. 
we don't only look at arterial flow, which is above the horizontal line, but we now look more closely to the line, to the flow in the venous side of the kidney. So you have to look at the renous venous flow. And normally you have a continuous renous venous flow. That means that on a continuous basis, blood is leaving the kidney. If you have heart failure, even before the occurrence of an increased central venous pressure, this continuous flow goes to a discontinuous renous venous flow. And that discontinuous venous flow is associated with an impaired response to diuretic agents. So the high V index are patients with a discontinuous renous venous flow. And what you could see is when you give them a diuretic agent, they actually pee out less water and less sodium, irrespective of their heart failure status, if they have REF or have PEF patients. Luckily, if you have discontinuous renous flow, that often changes to continuous flow with diuretic therapy. Therefore, don't only look at the heart, but also pay attention to the renous venous flow, but also to the lung ultrasound and jugular venous pressure. And it's very easy to, to visualize all of these systems to give you an accurate uh, assessment of congestion in your heart failure patients. And now, what is the real problem? The real problem is our unnatural craving for sodium. Why do I say unnatural? Because if I force my caregiver, Jan, to eat a tablespoon of salt, <laughs> you see that he really doesn't like it. <laughs> so it's actually disgusting. But still, all of us are eating on a continuous basis sodium. And you have to bear in mind that once you eat sodium, every bit of that sodium will be reabsorbed in your gut <laughs> because we don't lose sodium in our gut. What happens next? Well, we used to think that if you eat sodium, then that, that sodium will come into the plasma and then it will be excreted by the kidney. But that's not completely true because there are also stores in your body that can actually store sodium for a time that you would need it. And these stores are actually built of glycosaminoglycanes. These are long sugar molecules who are negative charges. And in those negative charges, you can store sodium. And if you have a normal interstitium, you can store a lot of sodium there in your skin, in your bone, and in your cartilage. If you have heart failure, however, we, have, we put down this hypothesis a couple of years ago that you have a disruption of these sodium stores and that will contribute to heart failure. When we postulated this hypothesis to the Journal of American College of Cardiology, I remember that its editor, Valentin Fuster, replied to us, I'm willing to publish this document on one condition, and it is that you have to prove to me that what you're actually postulating is actually true. And that's actually what we did. So after the, the publication of the review, we actually started our endeavor. And this is one of my PhD fellows taking a skin biopsy in my leg. And so even my leg was biopsied to actually uh, examine the gag content of my leg. And what you could see here is that if you're healthy, you have some angiotensin receptors in your skin. But once you have heart failure, there is an increased density of angiotensin receptors in your skin. And that actually pans out to lead to more gags into your skin. So we do actually have a very active RAS system in our skin that probably contributes to more sodium storages if you have heart failure. Now, of course, if you eat sodium, you're gonna get thirsty, you're gonna drink more water, you're gonna have an increased ADH secretion and a reduced RAS activity. And eventually that sodium will be filtered in your kidney. And a normal kidney filters a tremendous amount of sodium up to one kilogram of sodium every day, one kilogram. If you have a GFR of 10 mL per minute, so really a reduced GFR, even numbers that might need dialysis, you still filter about 150 grams of sodium. If you consider that you eat around four to five grams of sodium per day, it means that the filter is not the problem. Even heart failure patients with advanced CKD filter enough sodium to get a neutral balance. So that if the filter is not the problem, then the reabsorption is probably the, the, the biggest problem. And the nephron is a very long tubule. And the aim of the kidney is to preserve a GFR. 
to preserve a glomerular filtration rate of 100 ml per minute. Why? Because you need that filter to excrete all the toxic substances that your body actually makes every day. So you need 100 ml per minute. And the kidney will do everything. If you have heart failure with a reduced renal blood flow because of an increased central venous pressure or because of a poor cardiac output, you'll have a reduced GFR. And the kidney will react to that by vasoconstriction of the efferent side and vasodilatation of the afferent arterioles. That will preserve GFR, but you'll have an increased filtration fraction. Filtration fraction is uh, defined by the GFR divided by renal blood flow. So if my renal blood flow is reduced and my GFR is preserved, I have an increased filtration fraction. Increased filtration fraction actually means that you're gonna filter more of the water and sodium, which is gonna to go to the kidney. That has a tremendous impact on the reabsorption of water and sodium in the tubules. So normally the reabsorption in the proximal tubules is actually organized or actually driven by starling forces. But if you have heart failure and an increased filtration fraction, that means that the blood running next to the tubules has a higher oncotic pressure than the blood if you have filtered less water and sodium. This higher oncotic pressure will drive reabsorption of sodium and water. Normally, you're going to reabsorb about 65% of the water and sodium in the proximal parts of the kidney. But if you have heart failure, that number is increased to 75 or even 80%. So you're going to filter less if you have heart failure and you're going to reabsorb more sodium in the proximal parts of the kidney. What happens also is that you have a decreased effect of volume overload on your sympathetic tonus in the kidney. That means that you have more sympathetic activation in the kidney, which also drives and promotes proximal sodium reabsorption. At the loop of Henley level, normally you're going to reabsorb again sodium and chloride. If you have heart failure and you have less chloride that, that goes that, that still is in the, in the tubules because you've reabsorbed more proximal, that less chloride will be sensed by the macula densa. And if the macula densa senses less chloride, it's going to release renin. If the macula densa senses a lot of chloride, it's going to release adenosine. If you release renin, you're going to have more vasoconstriction at the efferent side of the arterioles, meaning you're going to increase your filtration fraction even more. Be aware that loop diuretic therapy blocks chloride uptake at the macula densa level, which means that you fool the kidney. If you give a loop diuretic even to a normal human being, the kidney will think that there is not enough chloride at the macula densa level and it will release renin. So loop diuretic therapy by itself leads to an increased renin secretion by the kidney. At the more distal stages, at the distal tubule, there is the fine tuning of the sodium reabsorption. And there are two hormones there which are responsible for that. It's aldosterone and AVP. If you have heart failure, of course, you're gonna have more aldosterone and more AVP leading to more sodium reabsorption and more water reabsorption in the distal parts of the kidney. So eventually you'll have a positive sodium balance and that positive sodium balance will of course lead to an increased plasma volume. And if the plasma volume is increased, your patient end up in a heart failure intensive care unit or an emergency room with congestion. And what do you do then? How can you medically decongest a patient? These are the guidelines. The guidelines of HFA written in 2016 recommended to use IV loop diuretic therapy in patients with acute heart failure and signs of fluid overload. They also stated how much we should, you should use, about 20 to 40 milligrams of IV furosemide. And then very importantly, they stated that the dose and the duration should be adjusted according to the patient's symptom and clinical status. That gives you a guidance but it doesn't really tell you how much you should give, when you should give it, and how you should titrate the diuretic therapy.
There is only one prospective randomized double-blind trial with loop diuretic therapy, and it's called the DOSE trial. In the DOSE trials, four different strategies of loop diuretic therapy were compared. A low dose, which was the home dose, versus a high dose, which was two and a half times the home dose, continuous versus bolus infusion every 12 hours. What you could see in a secondary endpoint was that the results were really bad. Up to 50% of the patients randomized in DOSE were actually dead or rehospitalized after two months of therapy. That's not really a good results. What was also bad was that the freedom from congestion, meaning the treating physician stating that the patient was dry at the moment that he was discharged was only 15%. So only one out of six of the patients included in those were actually dry at the end of the treatment period. Why is that? Well, there are many reasons for loop diuretic less responsiveness in heart failure. First of all, if you have acute heart failure and gut edema, there will be poor absorption of your oral diuretics. Secondly, you have to know that loop diuretics are actually secreted actively by the blood running next to the tubules. So you need high enough dosages. Why? Because they're also protein bind. So if the dosing is not high enough, they will not work. Again, like I told you before, if you give furosemide, you're gonna increase renin levels Therefore, your GFR might drop a little bit. Eventually, all of our patients with heart failure who are already on a loop diuretic have some kind of diuretic resistance. If you would infuse yourself, if you are normal with 40 milligrams of furosemide, you should be out about three liters of water and sodium over the next couple of hours. And almost none of our heart failure patients will respond like that. That is the reason why together with HFA, we put down this consensus document where we actually explained how we think you should use diuretic therapy in heart failure patients. The first thing you need to do when you assess a patient with congestion is to make the distinction between a patient with congestion and volume overload and fluid redistribution. Congestion is a hemodynamic definition of increased filling pressures. This can be accompanied with a lot of volume overload or with only minor volume overload. We're talking now about diuretic therapy in patients with congestion and volume overload. I'm not going to talk about a patient, for example, with half pef who develops atrial fibrillation and then develops flash pulmonary edema. That is not congestion with volume overload. The first thing you need to do is to give a loop diuretic as soon as possible. We call it the door to diuretic time. There are many studies emphasizing the importance of early administration of loop diuretic therapy. The longer you wait, the higher the likelihood, the likelihood will be that that patient will actually die or have a poor prognosis that is independent of his heart failure status. So what do you do and how much do you give? Well, you look at the patient and if he has congestion with volume overload and he was loop diuretic naive, meaning he was not on the loop diuretic at home, we start with 40 milligrams of furosemide IV bolus. If that patient was not loop diuretic naive, but was already taking a loop diuretic, you give him double the amount of what he was taking at home. So if he was on 40 milligrams of furosemide, you give him 80 milligrams IV bolus. And you do that as soon as possible, as soon as you see that patient. 40 milligrams of furosemide equals one milligram of bimetanide. What do you do then? Well, then it's your task to look at the effect of the drug. Loop diuretics work for six hours, not for 24 hours. So you have to look at the effect of the drug. How do you do that? We give you two options. Either you use the difficult way and it is to assess urine output, and that should be at least 100 cc per hour. Bear in mind that collecting urine is not so easy, but it should be at least 100 cc per hour. If you don't want to do that, I would take the easier way, and that is something that most of you probably are not doing, and that is to actually measure the quality of the urine. So send a, send a first spot urine to your lab, and that should have at least 50 mex sodium per liter. So you instruct your nurse that your patient empties his bladder before you give the loop diuretic. 
you give the loop theoretic and the first urine that the patient produced will be sent to the lab. And that should contain at least 50 mg sodium per liter. Then after six hours, you have to do something again. If the patient is still congested and he responding well to the loop theoretic therapy, you just continue the same dose regimen every 12 hours. If your patient, however, is not responding well, meaning he did not pee out 100 cc per hour, or his sodium concentration was not reaching 50 max per liter, you double the dose of the loop diuretics. There is a maximum dose of five milligram of bimetanide or 200 milligram of furosemide that you can give as a bolus. There's no need to add more than 200 milligrams as a bolus because then it's not gonna be more effect, it's not gonna be give more effects. While you're doing that, you do standard non-invasive monitoring of heart rate, you check for signs of hyperperfusion, and you continue your guideline-directed medical therapy. We would consider early utilization of MRAs, and during acute heart failure, we still recommend to do salt and water restriction. Why do we emphasize so much on the quality of the urine? Well, this is one of the many reasons. If you look at three consecutive days of diuretic therapy, you see on the left hand that the urinary volume per milligram furosemide is equal over the three consecutive days. However, the quality is actually changing of the urine. You see there is a drop in urinary sodium content with three consecutive days of loop diuretic therapy. How do you assess congestion? Well, you can use a combination of clinical signs and also a technical evaluation. And that is something that you have to get familiar with the way that you would like to do it in the best manner. What do you do the next day? Well, the next day, so after 24 hours of therapy, you re-evaluate re again the need for continuous decongestive therapy. If that patient peed out more than three to four liters over the 24 hour spam, you just continue the same dose. If the patient did not reach the goal, you double the loop diuretic but if you've reached the 200 milligrams of furosemide, you have to add another diuretic. Which options are there? The first option is a thiazide. Thiazides, they work distal in the nephron. They don't work proximal. They work more distal than the loop diuretics. They actually might counterbalance some hypertrophy that you see with chronic utilization of high dose loop diuretics. They also work in low GFR states but they are very slowly absorbed in the gut. That means that it's better to give a thiazide hours before you give the IV loop diuretic, which makes it a little bit impractical, especially during the first days of the diuretic therapy. But bear in mind that thiazides should only be used temporarily. Why? Because if you continue to use them, they're actually linked to an increased uh, incidence of recurrent heart failure and even increased mortality. The reason for that is probably linked to more iron disturbances. So you should not continue a thiazide on the long term, only use it short term to get rid of the congestion. What about high dose spironolactone? Is it worth to increase the 25 milligrams to 100 milligrams? This has been tested in the TINA trial. The TINA trial did not show any benefit with regards to more natriuresis more diuresis or more nt pro BMP reduction in acute heart failure. That means that it's not, probably not really helpful to increase the dose of MRAs. You should give them eh, always because they're very important, but they're not really gonna be helpful to decongest your patients. And then there are two very promising drugs. Remember that most of the sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal parts of the kidney. And that is why we have a lot of attention to diuretic agents that work in the proximal part of the kidney. The oldest and the cheapest one is acetazolamide. Acetazolamide is a very old diuretic agent. It costs eight euros per vial, so it's almost for free. And you can give it 500 milligrams IV bolus once daily on top of your loop diuretics. It actually boosts the diuretic response of your loop diuretics. We're doing now a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial in Belgium and 25 centers that will hopefully show superiority of the combination therapy of acetazolamide on top of loop diuretics. The other drug is, of course, SGLD2 inhibition. 
SGLD2 inhibition blocks glucose uptake in the proximal parts of the kidney. That's been tested in acute heart failure in a small trial, which is called AMPA response. And in that trial, it actually led to an increased urinary output. It's actually tested in several acute heart failure trials, for example, in the IMPULSE trial, and we're still awaiting the results. Bear in mind that SGLT2 inhibition is not a classical diuretic. If you give a classical diuretic agent, you're going to have more natriuresis. If you give an SGLT2 inhibition, you're going to have more osmotic diuresis. But that might help to decongest your interstitium. This is a figure we just are about to publish. When you look at classical decongestive therapy, you lower down the hydrostatic pressure in the plasma. If you give an SGLT2 on top of that, you're also going to increase the oncotic pressure in your plasma, therefore promoting the reabsorption of water and sodium from the interstitium back to the, re to the plasma. This probably will also help to lower down the reduction in plasma refill rate. We know if you give consecutive days of diuretic therapy that there is a reduction in plasma refill rate. It means you're going to refill the plasma lower on a slower pace. But if you add an SCLT2, this is probably a little bit less pronounced. That's why we feel that an SCLT2 on top of a loop diuretic might help you to decongest your patients easier. We're actually testing the HFA algorithm now prospectively in 25 sites all over the world. We're actually reaching all continents to do a prospective study, prospective trial to test the HFA algorithm. It's called the ENACT study. If any of you would be interested to participate in this trial, it's, we don't have money, but it's an investigated trial, please send me an email. We're more than willing to put you on board as well, but we hopefully will have um, the, the, all the centers getting together by the end of February. But again, if you would like to collaborate, just send me an email. What do you do if the kidney does not listen? Meaning what do you do if you see worsening renal function occurring? Also for that issue, we wrote a consensus document last year, which was published in European Journal of Heart Failure as well. So we have a patient with volume overload and you give him decongestive therapy with diuretics and you see the creatinine increasing or you see a GFR drop. So it's called worsening renal function. What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you assess, like we said before, the clinical status. Is the patient still congested? And you assess his diuretic response. If the diuretic response is good, meaning he's peeing out a lot of water and sodium, you don't really have to worry and you can just continue your decongestive therapy. Never stop decongestive therapy if your patient is still congested. And if you see a little bump in creatinine, that's not a problem. We call that pseudo worsening renal function. Okay, bear that in mind. However, if you have a poor diuretic response, meaning the patient is not responding well to the diuretic agents and your patient has still congestion, then it's time to check if the patient is in cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock, meaning hyperperfusion, needs an inotropic agent or even a pump. However, that happens only in less than 1% of the patients. 99% of the patients with worsening renal function, a poor diuretic response can be helped by increasing the diuretic intensity and also by the consideration of IV vasodilators. Why, v why IV vasodilators? Well, look at a normal heart. A normal heart is preload dependent. That means if you increase preload, stroke volume goes up. If you give a vasodilator to a patient without heart failure, you're going to reduce the blood pressure because you reduce preload and therefore stroke volume will be reduced and your cardiac output is reduced, your blood pressure drops. If you have a patient with half ref with a very dilated ventricle, these patients are not anymore preload dependent, but they are afterload dependent, meaning the higher the afterload, the lower the stroke volume. That is the fundamental principle why vasodilating agents actually work in failing hearts, in failing half ref patients. Because if you reduce afterload, you increase stroke volume. If you reduce preload, if you re reduce the stretched ventricle, 
you can end up at a better point in this Frank Starling curve, therefore also increasing stroke volume. I'm very fond of this IV vasodilating agent and it's called nitroprusside. Nitroprusside is a drug which is shown to be safe and effective even in patients with severe aortic stenosis in cardiogenic shock. This is a very elegant study. It's done in 25 patients and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Can you imagine 25 patients, New England Journal of Medicine, 2003? Why was it published? Because it's a proof of a principle. If you give vasodilators to a patient with a severe aortic stenosis and a severe reduced cardiac index, the cardiac index will be, will be improved. That means that afterload of the ventricle is not only the systemic vascular resistance. Afterload of the failing ventricle is mere the wall tension. And if you have a dilated ventricle, the pressure is high, the radius is high, and the wall thickness is very thin. And you can reduce with nipride the wall tension of such a ventricle. How do you give nipride? It's also very cheap. You do a continuous infusion. You start at 10 micrograms per minute and you just titrate to a mean arterial pressure of 60 milligrams mercury. It's the nurses who do it. And automatically when you do that, you'll see the hemodynamics improve. We've done a small observational study a couple of years ago, even almost 20 years ago in Cleveland, actually showing improved outcomes with the use of nipride versus no nipride in the patients that I was just, that I was just referring to. What other options do you have in the future? Perhaps this drug, Firisiguat. Firisiguat is an oral vasodilating agent showing to, shown to lead to an improved outcome in patients with acute heart failure up to BMPs of 8,000. The other drug was Omicamptiv. It's a positive inotropic agent. It did not really reach its primary endpoint. But you have to bear in mind that Virisiguat is a drug which I still believe it's going to be working. There are a lot of criticism about the, the, the Virisiguat, but why? The criticism is there because people say that they only had a hazard risk reduction of 10%. However, this was reached already after 11 months. If you compare it with DAPA, for example, or a paradigm that was all up to two years. So if you give Ferris cigarettes to a patient group, which is really sick, having almost 35% of events after 12 months, you already can save an event by treating for only 11 months. What do you do if the sodium drops? Because that's also a problem that we often see occurring, the appearance of hyponatremia. And what is the most important culprit in hyponatremia? I'll give you a second to think. Is it too little sodium in the blood? Is it too much water in the blood? Is it too much RAS activation? Or is it too much ADH secretion? If you would think about it, probably most of you would say number one, but that's not really correct. The biggest problem in hyponatremia in advanced heart failure is too much secretion of ADH. Let me explain it to you. So how do you approach a patient with hyponatremia? The definition of hyponatremia is a sodium below 135. The first thing you have to do is to check the plasma osmolarity. If the plasma osmolarity is not below 285, it's not hyponatremia, it's pseudo hyponatremia, and you don't have to, you still have to worry, but then it's not heart failure related. And most of the time there's something else going on, like for example, hypoglycemia. If you have hyponatremia and you have low plasma oncotic pressure, then you really have the hyponatremia that our heart failure patients are fearing. There are two types of hyponatremia. The first one is dilutional hyponatremia and the other one is depletional. Depletional is basically the, the fault between brackets of the physician because in those patients, patients really don't have so, enough sodium in their bodies. If you have dilutional hyponatremia, you retain a lot of sodium, but even more water. And these patients have an impaired free water excretion. And you really have to distinguish between these two phenomena because yeah, it's really important if you want to treat it. So depletional means you have to do a history clinical exam. You can measure the iron difference and you should also measure urine osmolarity. 
if you have depletional hypernatremia, you see a suppression of the urine osmolarity. If you, however, have dilutional hypernatremia, you see that the urine osmolarity is very high. Why? Because the body is not only retaining sodium, but even water. So you're retaining all the water and therefore you have a high urinary osmolarity. The clinical exam will also be different. Depletional means that patients don't, are, don't have fluid overload, while dilutional hypernatremia, patients most often have a lot of fluid overload. How do you treat it? If you have depletional hyponatremia, you should replete the sodium because these patients don't have enough sodium anymore. Bear in mind that you should also add potassium. If you add potassium, you're going to have a faster um, repletion of the sodium. And this is because of this formula that I put down here. And you can easily look at the paper and there you can find the details about how you should do that. If you ever have dilutional hyponatremia, you have to think of the reason. And the culprit in dilutional hyponatremia is a too much secretion of AVP or ADH. That's a hormone released by your, by your brain, basically. And the hormone will actually be incorporated in the distal part of the tubule, promoting more water reabsorption. What you, could actually, what you will see in these patients is normally, if you have an increase in plasma osmolarity, you have a secretion of ADH. If you have heart failure, however, this curve is pushed leftwards, meaning that for every oncotic pressure, you have a higher AVP secretion, promoting free water reabsorption. ACE inhibition actually puts this curve back to the right. So it's very important to treat these patients with ACE inhibition because that lowers down the secretion or the set point to secrete AVP. How do we treat it? Well, we have to temporarily stop distal working diuretics. Why? Because hyponatremia actually kills. So I don't want you to give thiazides or even MRAs in patients who have hypo hyponatremia when it's dilutional. This is the only reason outside of hyperkalemia that you can temporarily stop MRAs in HFREF patients. If you have the dilutional hypernatremia, you should temporarily stop the MRA, but then afterwards restart it. The other thing we have to try to do is to limit the free water intake because patients will not get rid of their water. And if you will give it to them, they will not be able to excrete it in their kidney. That is very difficult, of course, because these patients have a lot of ADH secretion and they are very thirsty. So they're actually craving for water. The only option, therefore, is to antagonize AVP and to improve distal nephron flow. Just by the way, as I explained to you before, add acetazolamide, add high-dose loop diuretic therapy, and add vasodilators. And if you do that, often you can bail out these patients with dilutional hypernatremia. And then the last part, how can we prevent that congestion reappears after a couple of months. The first thing is, how do you use loop direct therapy in patients who are deemed to be dry? Well, very important, if your patient is dry, there is no need for high dosages of loop diuretic agents. Loop diuretic agents should be used in a, in a variable fashion over time, never in a fixed dosing. If you overutilize loop diuretic therapy, you don't have room anymore to increase the dose of your disease modifying agents like the ACE, the beta blocker, the ARNI therapy. So only give low amounts of loop diuretic therapy to the patients who actually still need it in an ambulatory phase. More than 70% of my patients with HFREF are not on a loop diuretic anymore once they're sent home. And then of course, optimize the disease modifying agents. Disease modifying agents are ACE inhibition, RAB, ARNI, beta blocker, MRA, and ivabadrin, and now STLT2. And we don't do a good enough job for that. We have to try to increase the utilization of these class recommended drugs. We have now three new life-saving compounds in ambulatory HFREF patients who are with ongoing congestion. And so we have ARNI, we have dapagliflozin, and amiclifosin. When you look at the trial, again, the event rate was really high, up to 26% at two years in paradigm. 
risk reduction about 25% by the addition of dapagliflozin on top of the other agents in a DEPA trial. So these are very important drugs and we should really utilize them wisely in patients with ongoing congestion. Also important to bear in mind that these drugs actually do lower down the progression of CKD. Both RNA therapy and SGLT2 have proven to reduce the need for dialysis and have proven to reduce the progression of CKD, both probably by a reduction of intraglomerular hypertension. It's important that you recognize that CKD is very important. CKD is a more important prognosticator for our heart failure patients than injection fraction. The green line is a normal evolution of GFR once you reach the age of 50. You lose about one ml per year. If you have heart failure, that goes up to 2.5. And if you have heart failure with diabetes, it goes up to five. So adding a drug that can lower down the decline of CKD is really important. We have RNA therapy now in STLT2, and also CRT therapy has proven to lower down the progression of CKD. When you look at the patient with CKD, you know that the high GFR is associated with a better prognosis than the low GFR. However, you also have to take into consideration the drugs the patient is taking. I mean, if you have a GFR of 40 with RNA therapy in SGLT2, your prognosis is better than having a GFR of 50 without these drugs. So it's not only the GFR, but it's also the drugs that the patient is taking, which are important to predict prognosis. And done consecutively. That means we first started with ACE, then beta blockers, and then with MRA. It's always an add-on. But do you give a lot of everything or do you give some of all? There are more and more data now appearing that, that who state that it's better to give a little bit of everything than everything from only one drug. So it's better to combine the four drugs in lower doses just than only give two drugs in a very high dose. Is it worthwhile adding an SGLT2 if your patient is already on RNA therapy? The answer is yes, if the patient still fulfills the inclusion criteria of the trials. So if you have a patient on RNA, MRA, and beta blockers who is still congested and still has a poor ejection fraction, then it's worth adding an SGLT2 inhibition because you're going to improve his outcome. That is the reason why HFA put forward this guideline position paper stating that DAPA and empagliflozin are recommended to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization and CV death in patients with HFREF with or without type 2 diabetes. So the presence of diabetes should not deter you from giving an SGLT2 inhibitor. The other thing which you are really failing is to implement device therapy. It's very important that you recognize that, for example, CRT is also a therapy class one recommended therapy, which we underutilize. Only one out of three patients that should get a CRT device actually is getting the, DR, the device. And there are many reasons for it. One of the reasons is that we focus too much on pre-implant characteristics to deny CRT to a lot of patients. But if your patient has a wide QRS, typical left bundle bench block, and still poor ejection fraction despite medical therapy, there is absolutely zero reason to not give that patient a CRT device. You also have to bear in mind that like with any therapy, this is not a yes or no phenomenon with regards to response. So we should get rid of the not wording response to any therapy. If we would compare ourselves with oncologists, we would see that almost all of our patients after such an implant will have at least a partial remission of their disease. And reaching a partial remission of disease if you have heart failure is already a very good result because the natural disease progression is so, is so bad. And how are we gonna follow up these patients in the future? Well, potentially by new innovate, innovative technology. This is MEMS technology that allows us to continuously monitor PA pressure, especially, worry, especially um, of use in patients with advanced heart failure. The left is Cardiomems from Abbott, and the right picture is Cordella. It's from a new company, Endotronics. And we were fortunate, fortunate enough to do the first in men um, device a couple of years ago. What it actually provides you is an online 
at-home reading of a PA pressure in a patient, and therefore you can change the therapy. This is, for example, a patient which had a lot of fluctuations in his PA pressure, and once we improved compliance, everything went better. The other patient had an initial very high PA pressure, and we added an STLD2 inhibitor because the patient was not volume overloaded, and what you could see is a spectacular drop in PA pressure with an improved outcome. We, have, we actually done a small trial where we, where we gave um, SGLT2 inhibitors to patients with increased PA pressures, and what we could see is a spectacular drop in PA pressure over time. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, David, Nina, diuretic therapy in congestive heart failure patients, it, you have to start early, evaluate the effect of diuretics early on, either by urinary sodium spot analysis or by urinary output measurement. You have to reassess congestion and the volume setters at least after six hours again and then the next day to reassess the need for ongo ongoing diuretic therapy. But chronic prevention comes from up titration of neuromonal blockers in half ref patients, implementation of device therapy, treatment of comorbidities, and inclusion in multidisciplinary disease management programs. With regards to CKD, it's important to know that CKD affects 50% of our heart failure patients. It is associated with a doubling of risk for all-cause mortality, but misinterpretation of GFR changes often results in inappropriate discontinuation of decongestive or neuromonal blocker therapy. I thank you for your attention. I'm more than willing to answer any questions you might still have. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. Hi, Nina. Hi. Would you, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Great talk, um, especially I'm in the ER right now and it gives a lot of just handy things um, I can do right away. Uh, especially the door to diuretic time. I really like that approach. And uh, when I read your position paper, um, I was surprised there's so much about the urine in there. I'm uh, happy about that coming from the nephrology front. Um, so one question I have um, in the volume status assessment, you, uh, you don't put there to listen to the lungs, right? Because uh, the rails or listen to the lung has such a low sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So do you even bother to listen to your patient's lungs? No, 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 I do. I do. I, we, of course, we do a clinical exam. But if, if you want to, I think if, the, if you want to give diuretic therapy, we should give it especially to patients with volume overload. And of course, if you have pulmonary edema, that's also a sign of volume overload, which we take into consideration. But I, I, want, I would like to make a distinction between volume overload and fluid redistribution. And so the typical half pef patient goes in atrial fibrillation, then develops pulmonary edema. He or she also needs a little bit of diuretic therapy, but they probably need a little bit other therapies than, than only diuretic therapy. So to assess the need for diuretic therapy, I think it's probably more important to look at edema in the legs or of pleural effusion or even ascites. But of course, we listen to the lungs as well. And you have to do a comprehensive exam, I think, to assess the need for, un for ongoing diuretic therapy. That being said, we too struggle sometimes with the assessment of congestion in a patient, especially in younger patients. It's not so difficult, I think, in elderly people, but if you're like, if you have a patient with a heart failure of 30, 40, there it's sometimes very difficult to assess volume overload because often these patients don't really have a lot of edema, probably because their interstitium is so tight. So in those patients, it's more difficult. So dear colleagues, um, so some of you asked already questions in the in the WhatsApp group or the YouTube comments. So uh, we're open to ask your questions to Professor Mullins too. Um, you said that you know, loop diuretic therapy um, will increase um, renin levels. Yeah, that's um, correct. Um, but we say on a regular basis, we see patients you know, who are stable, who are on a minimal dose, of loop directed therapy. What do you think, what was the rationale um, why it was established that way? And you know, that we try to, again, you know, give us a new tradition on stopping um, yeah. loop diuretics. You know, I think, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, th there is still a lot of argument amongst the heart failure community. And there are people who are saying that if you don't take a loop diuretic that you don't have heart failure. 
and I absolutely don't agree to that sentence. I mean, the key is when you have a patient with heart failure and congestion, that you treat the congestion well in an acute phase, either in a, during a hospitalization or in an ambulatory phase. And you try to get that patient as dry as possible. Once that patient is dry, a lot of them don't need a diuretic anymore. However, we still have a lot of, we still have 30% of our patients who are still need diuretics on the long term. And those are mostly the patients who have CKD with some type of RV dysfunction. Especially if you have significant TR, it remains very difficult to get them off their loop diuretic completely, probably because you can never get rid of the congestion completely. You can get rid of the volume overload, but mm -hmm. since they still have TR with a little bit of elevation of central venous pressure, that promotes more sodium retention. But I think overall, we don't emphasize enough that you probably can withhold diuretic therapy in patients who are dry, who have a low anti-pro BMP or normal RV function and who are on optimal disease modifying agents. So if you do a BMP measurement and your, G and your BMP is two or 300 and you're still on five milligrams of bimetanide, that's probably not a need to give him five milligrams of bimetanide. Mm. How would you differentiate between um, the congestion and volume overload? Yeah, the, the congestion is a hemodynamic definition. Eh? And I think you can do that either by, by a catheter, which of course we're not going to do all the time, or by echo, or by a clinical exam. If you see really an elevated central venous pressure and there is absolutely no edema, edema, well, then, then you have congestion without edema. But that is probably a patient who's still going to need diuretics in the long term. Mm, you know, what uh, do you have something in the list? Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, ask, I really like the approach with uh, acetazolamide, so to have a diuretic that works in the proximal tubule uh, and combine it with loop diuretics, and you, you just said it's a very old um, medication, so do you know why didn't anyone think about this earlier? Oh, because there is no pharmaceutical company interested, I think, Nina. Okay. And, you know, and also the, the, the diuretic effect of the drug, when you give it in, as a monotherapy, it's not really effective. But we and others have actually demonstrated that it actually boosts your loop diuretic therapy. So in a combination, it's really effective. We're never going to use acetazolamide in the long term. We're only going to give it like a breakthrough drug for a couple of days. Yeah, and which company would, would, would invest in a drug which costs eight euros that you're going to give for four days? I think that's the reason. That's why I mean, we got a grant of the, basically of the Belgium government to do a big trial, a large grants, and we hopefully will finish the trial by the end of the year. And I really hope that that will be a breakthrough for the, for the therapy of these patients. Right. So what I learned and what I was amazed by is uh, that you showed that uh, venous congestion is the main driver for um, renal failure in uh, in, in, uh, in heart failure mm -hmm. and it's not the forward uh, failure of mm -hmm. um, the forward failure component of the heart failure. Um, this is not common knowledge among a lot of people coming out of med school. Uh, yeah, of course, if you take it to the extremes and if you would have a cardiac output of two liters, then that also gonna impair renal function. Eh? But just look at, you know, from observational point of view, you see as many worsening real function occurring in half PEF patients than in half REF patients. And if you would measure cardiac output in a half PEF patient, they would have a cardiac output of seven or eight liters. So that means that forward flow is not the problem in those patients. But I, I agree. I think a lot of medical schools are changing. Of course, it's not only us. There are many groups in the world have shown the similar data. And it also makes sense. I mean, the kidney can auto-regulate its, its, its forward flow, but it cannot do something from its, from its backward failure. If you reduce forward flow to the kidney, it can open up the arterial, the, the afferent side, and it can give vasoconstriction to the efferent side, but it cannot re respond to any increase in central venous pressure. So from a pathophysiological point, point of view, it makes sense. Okay. You mentioned the pseudo uh, worsening renal function in patients with what is sometimes called cardiorenal syndrome yeah. um, in the acute phase when given diuretics. Um, when I started my residency, I was super afraid in um, increasing creatinine because I thought, you know, maybe 
the patients I have volume overload, but maybe it's not intravascular at the moment. Yeah? Yeah. So I made them too dry, the kidneys giving up. Yeah. How do you, you know, what do you think about it? What are, are levels you are okay with? And yeah. what are levels where you would say, you know, maybe that's too much now? Yeah, it's a good question. It's also a very difficult question to answer. I think, of course, if you see a doubling of the serum creatinine, then you are in trouble. Yeah, but if you see the creatinine, let's say your creatinine or your GFR is about, it's like 50 and it drops to 40 or even 35. And you still have a very good, on the condition that you have a good diuretic response and your patient is still volume overloaded, we don't really mind. That's, a, that's solely a hemodynamic problem in the hemodynamic phenomenon in the glomerulus of the kidney, but that's not going to give, give structural damage to the kidney. I mean, there have been many tests done before by they measured, for example, ANGA levels, and you see a little, little bump, but you don't really see damage to the kidney. But if your GFR goes from 50 to 20, then you're in trouble, of course. And then you have to do something else. And those are the patients, if, especially if they don't respond well to diuretic agents that we still consider for ultrafiltration. But to be very honest, we use ultrafiltration far, far less than we used to do 10 years ago, because with a good implementation of diuretic therapy at, um, and adding vasodilator therapy, most of the times you can bail these patients out. So one of our colleagues asks, um, Dear Jutta, hi, um, do you think that measuring plasma volume will have future impact on clinical management of decongestion? Well, it's the, it's the work of Jeff Testani, which I really like. Um, and even he thinks it's not going to be really worthwhile to do it in, an, in, an, in a patient itself. It's going to give you information on the long term if a patient is dry, but it's could, not going to... Could you shortly explain what, what that means, um, measuring the plasma volume and how it would help, yeah. what the idea behind yeah. it is? Yeah, so plasma. So you, you could measure plasma volume by different methods, uh, but there is, for example, a radionucleo, radionucleotide method that's where you inject a dye basically into, a, into a, a patient to actually assess the plasma volume and then do follow-up plasma volume assessments on a daily basis to see if you see a plasma volume reduction. And then people think if you have a plasma volume reduction or a hemat hematocrit increase that at a certain moment of time, your patient is dry. The problem is that these occurrences happen late during the decongestive state, and they are very um, impractical to do. And they're more worth on a population level than on an individual patient level. And that's a little bit where the problem is. So I don't think, or most of us don't feel you can use them in an individual patient as a sole surrogate to assess if your patient is dry. I have on my list one last question. Nina, how about you? Um, yeah, I. Uh, if you could say um, a, a short sentence about uh, drip versus bolus again. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so drip versus bolus, they probably are equal, but it's easier to use bolus than drip. So if you use the, 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 the objective is to reach high enough dosages in your kidney for your diuretic to actually work. So if you give a continuous infusion, you should bolus first and then start your continuous infusion, but it's far more easier to give two or three times a day a bolus than to give a continuous infusion. So for ease of use and probably also for effectiveness, a bolus infusion on the condition that you repeat it is probably the best way to go. Okay, thanks. And what I would just want to make sure I understood correctly is um, you wouldn't give tiazid therapy um, in patients with a um, delusional hyponatremia. Is that correct? Yeah, it's good. we wouldn't use it temporarily because why if you would give it you were going to increase the hyponatremia and so if you give an MRA or a thiazide you're going to lose more sodium distal and if you already have a dilutional hyponatremia you're going to aggrav you're going to make the, the hyponatremia worse so that is the only reason why we would at least temporarily hold those diuretic agents in those patients. And this is something you know, from a, you know it's a reflex in, in a, a lot of people I know that you would do a sequential blockade in a patient yeah. uh, with a hypervolemia. 
Yeah, I I under I understand, but I think it's better to to reduce the sodium reabsorption in those patients proximal, and then you increase the nephron flow, and then automatically, normally, the hyponatremia will resolve. Yeah, and uh, it's in, it's interesting because in, in the guidelines, as far as I understood, tiazides are recommended as um, for for uh, the management of arterial um, hypertension. Yeah, but, um, but I'm not talking about, we're talking now here about the utilization of a thiazide to decongest your patient. Eh? Of course, for thiazides are, are a very cheap drug to treat hypertension. It's interesting that I, basically nobody knows how they work, eh? because if you give a thiazide long-term, they don't give you any more sodium uh, excretion, but yet they provide um, a blood pressure reduction. So probably thiazides for blood pressure long-term work more through a vasodilating effect than through a natriuresis. Interesting. I was uh, thinking about you know, whether we, should, we shouldn't give uh, thiazides in the long run, even, even for um, arterial hypertension management in these patients and go for other drugs. Yeah, I think in heart failure patients, I wouldn't recommend it. There we have so many other drugs that actually have proven to, to improve their lifespan that I don't think we need, should use thiazides in those in half ref patients at least. I have learned a lot. Nina, do you have something you know you would like to ask? Um, no, but thank you. Uh, learned a lot. This yes, was you. a great talk. So I, as far as I can see, you know, all questions asked in the chats are um, asked too. So thank you very much. So Peter, I hope to see you soon again. Same. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.